This evening we're going to hear about an individual who was critical to our community and to our laboratory. More than anyone else, he was responsible for many, if not most of us, being here in Los Alamos tonight. Los Alamos bears scant resemblance to the wartime army camp of 1945. For this we can thank Norris Bradbury. He was the second director on our MESA, but the first director of the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, where the nuclear weapons mission that stayed remarkably consistent over the past 64 years. Norris was the director in 1949 when Los Alamos became the 32nd county in New Mexico, a date we're now celebrating as our county's, county's 60th anniversary. Lori Mann and Chris Chandler are the co-chairs of this celebration, which includes this talk tonight, co-sponsored with the Historical Society and the Los Alamos National Bank. Uh, I invited uh, Jim and David uh, Bradbury to come, and I wondered whether they had uh, succeeded in sneaking in, but I didn't see them. Uh, they expressed an, an interest in being here, so uh, I, would, I was hoping that uh, they would be present for this talk. Also, I'm curious, I'd like to see a show of hands of those of you who knew Loris or Norris Bradbury. My God, that's impressive. I, I think we should attract some younger people here. <laughs> Thanks very much. Our speaker tonight is laboratory historian Alan Carr. Alan is the author of the excellent historical society book, The Forgotten Physicist about Robert Bacher. During his tenure as laboratory historian, Alan has produced several publications pertaining to the Manhattan Project early nuclear weapons design, and nuclear testing history. His most recent work, works include a book chapter on the British contribution to the Manhattan Project for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Alan has also given presentations for the National Council on Public History and the Historical Society of New Mexico. Please welcome Alan Carr. Good evening. Good evening. You know, I saw a lot of hands come up a while ago, so I'm officially intimidated now. <laughs> no, I, you know, I've seen a lot of familiar faces, and, uh, you know, it's really good to see each and every one of you tonight, and uh, hopefully you'll find this interesting. Uh, you know, for those of you who are considered, considering joining the Historical Society, don't let this talk deter you. There are, there are quality <laughs> productions uh, that the Historical Society is, is getting together all the time, but... Uh, no, it, it is great to be here, and uh, I'd like to thank John for that introduction. John was, uh, he also reviewed these slides, and I had many conversations with John and uh, others, including Jim Bradbury. Uh, I talked with Mel Brooks uh, just the other day. Many other uh, folks who, who knew uh, Norris Bradbury, Harold Agnew, and others. And uh, even though they offered me suggestions and uh, gave me some of their ideas that have been incorporated in, uh, full responsibility for any mistakes lays with Hopkins over there, so uh, <laughs> it's a <laughs> no, but uh, no, it, it, it's good to be here tonight, and uh, so this is a first time uh, lecture. I haven't done this one before, and a lot of these things, you know, I do over and over, and it becomes uh, kind of, kind of almost second nature. So uh, we'll see how this one comes out. <laughs> this is a big crowd for a first time talk, uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Now the the first part of the presentation. Uh, the first half we're going to go through pretty quickly. It's more about Norris's uh, early life and his background. We're going to kind of get an introduction to what he was actually. Uh, that a little bit. That a little bit better. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, let me know. You know, throw something or yeah, <laughs> we can get to, that's something we can fix. So uh, uh, the rest of it I don't know, but we can get that fixed. But uh, you know, we'll, we're going to go through the beginning of the presentation a little bit quickly because I'd like to spend more time on, uh, on his career and uh, some of those things. But uh, let's start out by uh, getting to meet him. Yeah, here comes the Bradbury contingent. So welcome. <laughs> 
So you, I think they could have skipped this first slide. <laughs> uh, but anyway, who, who was Norris Bradbury? And so on this first slide here, these are some of his uh, some of his many accomplishments. He was a graduate of Pomona College, that's just outside of uh, Los Angeles. He graduated with highest honors. He was a member of the National Research uh, Council, or a fellow, I should say. A Naval Reserve office, uh, officer for many, many years. A Berkeley-trained physicist. A Stanford professor, a wartime group leader here at Los Alamos. He was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, for a long time, I've been told, he was about the only member of the academy here in Los Alamos. So he, uh, this was something that was very prestigious as well. He's been called the savior of Los Alamos, the architect of the modern laboratory, and Mr. Los Alamos. So I think that's a pretty impressive list of qualifications. Uh, now, here's some neat stuff, I think. He was also a very, very skilled woodworker. He made lots of different things. He, made, uh, he was very good at making furniture, made furniture for his grandchildren. He was a gardener. Now, you know, I was a gardener until about a week ago today. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, gardening and keeping a lawn in Los Alamos, New Mexico isn't very easy for a variety of reasons. And uh, as you can see in the photos here, we found this nice color picture of his lawn. I don't think that's real. Uh, I don't see how you could do that up here. But uh, uh, he was a very good gardener and yard man. Uh, as you can see, there's the proof. Uh, he was an amateur archaeologist. He really enjoyed driving from site to site in this very rich archaeological reason. He had an old pickup truck that he would uh, drive around in. But before uh, he had that old pickup truck, he had a Model A Ford for many, many years. And uh, because he had a Model A Ford, he had to be a good mechanic. <laughs> and so he was a very good mechanic as well, took that car apart, rebuilt it uh, several times. We're gonna hear a little bit more about that car in just a minute. He was also a world traveler. As you can see there, he's getting a, uh, getting a ride. That is, what, that is in um, what is today Sri Lanka. That was one of the many, many places that he traveled. Uh, I think Mexico was probably about his favorite uh, destination to go to. And finally, he was a family man. And by all accounts that I've heard, he was a very good one at that. And so uh, that's kind of the, uh, the softer side of Norris Bradbury outside of the laboratory. Now moving on, you know, what was he really like, right? We all want to get a feel for that. I asked a lot of people who, uh, who knew Norris and, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, how would you describe him? And uh, these are some of the quotes that I came across. Now the first two, uh, are from Lois Bradbury. These were in a Los Alamos publication. He lived as though he were killing snakes every minute of the day. Whatever he was doing, it was always zip, zip, zip. So he was always going, always doing something, always making something better. Uh, that was something that I uh, saw consistently throughout his uh, lifetime. He was a nice man, both fair and honest. He was careful and conservative. He was very calm and collected. And, you know, I thought about that in the first two quotes there. So I think that it was kind of this controlled energy, you know, maybe that's the best way uh, to describe him. He was not flamboyant. And from what I've seen, that's a pretty big understatement. <laughs> he was about the uh, opposite of, uh, as, as opposite to flamboyant as you can be. Uh, now, this next one was one that I heard quite a bit. He was easy to like. And as we look at his career, we're going to see that this very simple statement played uh, a lot to do uh, in the success that Norris Bradbury enjoyed as his quarter century uh, as director of Los Alamos Laboratory. And then finally at the bottom, <laughs> and I think John contributed this one, <laughs> he was patient even with Edward Teller. And uh, <laughs> he was a patient man, you know. <laughs> now this is a quote that was in uh, Bradbury's, uh, this was in his National Academy's uh, obituary, and Harold Agnew and Raymer Schreiber wrote this. He had little patience for the perks of top management. His office was strictly functional. No carpeting, no lounge chairs, simply GI office furniture. And it's still that way today. No, not really. I'm just, <laughs> I wanted to see if, if I'd get a response. So things have changed. Uh, there were no reserved parking areas for individuals, although I wish they were. It's been hard to get one lately over there uh, with all the students in town. 
His usual attire was casual. In fact, if he appeared for work in a business suit, it meant he was expecting VIPs or that he was about to leave on official business. His office door was open all day, except when he was in conference. He answered his phone himself, unless he was already on the line. For a number of years, he drove a battered Model A Ford Coupe with a rumble seat and warned passengers to beware of the insecure door locks and the holes in the floorboards. <laughs> now, I should say, another thing that I heard was that Norris was very interested in safety and security, except apparently with his choice of automobiles. So <laughs> he eventually donated the car to the high school student shop to use for repair practice. And so I, hopefully this has given you, well, all of you, many, I, I, half of everybody here already knew him. So I guess uh, these first few slides have been kind of irrelevant, but <laughs> they're, hopefully to the rest of you, they uh, give you some insight to what this man was, uh, was actually like. Now let's go back in time and start our chronological look at the life of Norris Bradbury. You know, I noticed that in uh, some of the uh, different advertising for this talk, and I hope that it wasn't overhyped and you're not disappointed, but uh, you know, this was kind of billed as the uh, Los Alamos years. And uh, really this was more of, you know, I want to cover uh, Norris Bradbury's entire life, at least to some extent at least as much as information as I can fit in in the next three hours. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, well, anyway, Norris Edwin Bradbury was born May 30th, 1909 in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, his mother, Elvira, was a teacher, and there's, there's a picture uh, of the two of them there. Isn't that a great picture? Yeah. So, many of you have probably seen that before. I love that photograph. Uh, uh, I don't think that smile ever lost, left Norris Bradbury's face because uh, he looks very similar uh, in the uh, pictures that will be upcoming. A uh, little less hair, but uh, for the most part the same. That, he had a great smile throughout his lifetime. Now, his father Edwin was an electrician and a gardener and a landscape architect, a vine dresser, a rancher, a machinist, a stamp collector, and I ran out of space on the slide. There's like 10 million other things too. So very much like Norris though, uh, he was, not only was he interested in a lot of different things, he was very good at a lot of different things and his father was the same way. And so I think that's where, uh, where he got a lot of th those different interests from. Now Bradbury uh, had a sister, she died as an infant, but his parents adopted fraternal twins. And I think that, uh, his brother and sister grew up to be, uh, I believe that his uh, sister was a phone operator, like a very large scale supervisor uh, type of phone operator. And he, his brother was a uh, aircraft mechanic. I think he worked on helicopters and, and things like that. Now uh, he attended Hollywood uh, High School, Hollywood High School, it's the Hollywood, you know, right there in uh, north of downtown Los Angeles and later Chaffee Union High Schools. Now Chaffee Union High School is out east of Los Angeles. You have uh, Pomona, Ontario, Fontana. It's, Chaffee Union High School is generally in the Ontario uh, area there. And so that's where he spent his time. He was 16 years old when he graduated. Now I, I thought that was pretty impressive. I was very fortunate to graduate at 18. <laughs> uh, I finished 278th in my class, so I, I, I wouldn't have lasted long against uh, Norris Bradbury, I don't think. But he was a very good student uh, when he was growing up out there. And uh, again, you see uh, there's his student ID card from 1925, and uh, I think that uh, he was around 15 or 16 when he's on that motorcycle uh, that you see there, so he was always moving. Now we'll talk about Bradbury the college student, at least the, uh, you know, the G-rated version at least. So uh, Bradbury was a member of Pi Kappa Alpha, and this is his fraternity, this, this big picture up here. Now some of you who've been around for a while, I want you to carefully look at that picture and see if you can find another Los Alamos personality in there. Anybody, anybody see anyone? You, you see this blob? I know the pictures aren't as clear as I'd like, but although this, although this does look pretty good, this is Duncan McDougal. And so man, many of you probably knew Duncan McDougal, and right now you're thinking, oh, Duncan McDougal. He's the guy who used to send me my letters back to have them grammatically corrected. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, Duncan McDougal and, and Norris Bradbury went way back, um, as you can see. They were both members of the fraternity, 
1929, uh, Bradbury received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Pomona College. Again, Pomona is kind of halfway between downtown Los Angeles and Fontana, so he stuck around home for his undergraduate work. Uh, his district, or well, let me skip ahead. I should have flipped those around. In 1932, he received his PhD in physics from Berkeley. His dissertation was on the mobility of uh, ions and gases. While he was there, he studied, uh, studied under a, a gentleman named uh, Leonard Lubb. Now, the big photograph there is Lubb. He, uh, we're going we're gonna to see him again in a couple of slides because he was tremendously influential on Norris Bradbury's early life. Now, while he was studying, he won Whitting and National Research Council fellowships. And in 1933 and 4, after he graduated, he was a postdoctorate uh, fellow at the Massachusetts in Institute of Technology. So as you can see, uh, he spent his academic career at several very prestigious institutions. He was an excellent student. And uh, I think that his prowess as a scientist is often forgotten because he was such a good administrator for so many years. Now we'll talk about some big uh, decisions that he made in his personal life. In 1933, Bradbury married Lois Platt. Now I love this quote down here. And, and by the way, from here on out, when you see these quotes in, uh, in italics, that's, that's uh, Bradbury speaking. I thought I'd let him try and help me tell the story. Lois was the sister of my roommate in college. She was engaged to someone else. The engagement fell apart, and I moved in. <laughs> Well, I wish I could do that. I was, I was like, man. <laughs> but that's, that's how they met, like a, like a vulture circling, just waiting, you know. But uh, Norris and Lois had been married 64 years when Norris finally passed away. 64 years. Uh, that's, uh, that's almost unheard of. Uh, they had three sons, Jim, John, and David. I believe uh, I saw Jim and David walk in back there. And again, I'd like to thank Jim uh, for meeting with me and uh, uh, taking a look at the uh, presentation. I really in enjoyed his company, and that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Now, going back to Professor Lubb, he had been a former Naval Reserve officer, and he recommended to uh, Bradbury that he join up and apply for a commission, and he did. Now, in the early 30s, he became an ordnance specialist, and uh, I thought it was kind of interesting, Lieutenant Commander Chester M. Nimitz, this is who would be in charge of the entire Pacific uh, fleet or, or area of operations in World War II, signed Bradbury's commission. So I think that was his uh, first step in winning World War II, <laughs> way back there uh, almost a decade before we were involved in it. Okay, so the young professor, mid-30s. In 1935, Bradbury was named assistant professor of physics at Stanford. By then he had published numerous articles in prestigious publications. These were, uh, you know, he was pretty well published. He, he put together some really good articles that were published in, uh, I think, the Journal of Applied Physics and other things like that. He was an expert on the conduction of electricity and gases, ion properties, and atmospheric electricity. So at the same time, he was, ed uh, he was widening his repertoire in science and also becoming a uh, ordnance expert in the Navy. So as you can see, the pieces are beginning to fall into place that would eventually bring him to Los Alamos. In early 1941, Bradbury was called to active duty. Now, in early 1941, World War II had been going on for nearly a year and a half in Europe, but we were not involved yet. It wouldn't be until December 1941 that we jumped in. But nonetheless, this was a very troubling time, and that's where I uh, Bradbury was called up to active duty. He studied the exterior ballistics of naval projectiles. Now exterior ballistics is when the projectile actually leaves the tube of the gun. How does, the, how does it uh, uh, function? And so this was very important. You can see Bradbury's quote, the first round from a gun might be its last, especially if it didn't work well. <laughs> and it was necessary to hit the target the first time. And so that's why the behavior of these large very large artillery shells, essentially, that were being fired on uh, large Navy ships was important. And so that's what he was studying on the eve of World War II. And that, those studies would eventually take him to the Naval Proving Grounds at Dahlgren, Virginia. At Dahlgren, he worked with Lubb, we all remember him, uh, his professor, and Captain William Sterling Parsons, also known as Deke Parsons. Now, I bet there are a lot of people in here that have heard that name also. Parsons uh, is kind of, I think, uh, relatively one of the unsung heroes of the Manhattan Project. We're going we're gonna to see from him on the next slide as well. 
Uh, one interesting thing I always like to point out when Parsons is mentioned is that he's a native New Mexican. He was born in uh, Santa Rosa. Now I traveled through Santa Rosa fairly often going back and forth between here and Lubbock, Texas where my folks are. And uh, you know, I don't know, t anyone been through Santa Rosa before? <laughs> yeah. What's going on at Santa Rosa? <laughs> You know, it's like the, you know, Billy the Kid's carcass is here. Come check it out. You know, there's all this stuff going on. You know, there are all these signs about all the, I mean, there's, I think there's even like a marathon or so, something set up like that around Billy the Kid, you know. So they, they love Billy the Kid in, in uh, Santa Rosa down there. And below all the billboards and the signs and everything else, you'll find a little brown state historical type of sign as you're pulling into town uh, that says home of the atomic admiral. And so, uh, you know, next time you're going through Santa Rosa, go slowly and look for the little sign uh, there for Deke Parsons. But, but he's a native son of the state of New Mexico, and uh, I, I always think that's worth pointing out. Now, in 1943, in, in the early mid part of the year, or the mid part of the year, I should say, Parsons left Dahlgren for Los Alamos. Just disappeared, like a lot of other people did. <laughs> well, about a year later, Parsons offered Bradbury a job at the laboratory. So we're talking probably in the uh, early summer of 1944. Bradbury really didn't want to do that at first. You know, a lot of people didn't really want to come to Los Alamos <laughs> upon being offered, uh, being given off the offer the first time. But as he says here, my conscience got the better of me. I got to thinking about the blue uniform I was wearing and who, I w and who was I to argue about where I was assigned. I called Parsons and told him I'd take the job. And I think that's kind of Bradbury in a nutshell. He knew what his duty was, and he was ready to accept it. And so off he went into the desert. Mm. You know, when he got here, he was probably rethinking that decision. <laughs> because that's what he lived in right there. Uh, good old-fashioned sunk department. You know, a lot of those buildings that were built uh, in this era, uh, time frame for the lab, you know, they were built overnight. Uh, I mean, they just built these things. They built the entire laboratory. There was nothing here. And then in the matter of a couple of months, you had a laboratory, all of these, you know, necessary buildings go along with it, like places for people to live. Uh, these buildings were designed and constructed to last about five years. So you can imagine, <laughs> I imagine even when they were brand new, they weren't the most fun or uh, comfortable places to live. But anyway, that's a picture of the old Sun apartments. He later got to upgrade to a bathtub row home and we're, most of us here are probably familiar with Bathtub Row over there behind Fuller Lodge where the, uh, ranch, uh, boy, where the ranch school uh, teachers stayed and things like that. So anyway, while Bradbury was here, he served as a group leader uh, for several different groups. Really, it was almost kind of the same group and it just changed names. So as you can see, some things never change. <laughs> I've been here for about six years and I've been in about four or five different groups. Same thing, different number or, or letter. So, uh, but anyway, why was Bradbury here? And he answers that, I guess I was picked for the project because I had worked with Parsons, had had some chemistry, remember from his undergraduate days, was a physicist. I knew a little about nuclear physics and I had had some ordinance experience at Dahlgren. And so that's Bradbury's kind of nice way of saying, I was the ideal candidate. Of course I was there, you know. Well, the, uh, as you can see, the groups that he worked for, E5 was the first one. Now E of course, stands for ordinance, which, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how that goes. Uh, E5 was the implosion experimentation group, and uh, he worked for Parsons at first. Parsons was the head of the ordinance division. He was an associate laboratory director. Uh, that was also something I should have mentioned a while ago. There were two associate laboratory directors during World War II. Parsons was one, and Rico Fermi was the other one. And so that may give you some idea of the kind of stature that uh, Deke Parsons enjoyed. He wasn't there very long before he went to X1, a few months later. Now, many of you who remember this World War II story remember that there were two entirely different types of nuclear bombs. Remember the gun-assembled device, which used uranium, and the implosion-assembled device, uh, which used plutonium. Well, when they found out that the plutonium wouldn't work in a gun-assembled device, they wanted to figure out a way to make it work quick. And so Oppenheimer completely reorganized the laboratory in August of 1944 to construct an implosion type bomb. One of the divisions that was created during that uh, reorganization was X divisions. 
uh, X Division. Now we have an X Division today that is the weapons design division. Back then it was X for explosives. And so they worked on the explosives portions uh, of the atomic bomb, the high explosives portions, I should say. Um, and so he worked for uh, this guy here, if you can see him. That's George Kistiakowsky. Uh, many of you probably have heard that name before. Kistiakowsky is an interesting guy, too. He fought during the Russian Civil War for the monarchy and finally found his way over here, liked blowing stuff up. I think he, uh, he cut a, uh, carved the first ski hill through the mountains uh, using explosives. Good times back then. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, while Bradbury was uh, working for him, he was the head of the implosion research group, the assembly and assembly tests group. And then uh, for a short period it, toward the end of the war, he was in Z1, uh, the experimental systems group. Now Z division was really, they were the guys who worked on the exterior, well, uh, the casings, things like that. The actual, not the nuclear components of the bomb per se, but all of the, uh, the casings, the things like that, actually getting, getting them in planes and getting them delivered. That important function was transferred down to Albuquerque and Z division eventually grew into what is today uh, Sandia National Laboratories. I think we're ready for a new slide. Everybody still awake? Yeah, I'm there. I know it's it's kind of it's kind of dim in here, and it's been a long day. I've seen a lot of open eyes, though. I'm impressed. You're a hearty group. So uh, let's talk about the Trinity test. You know, we talked about the implosion bomb, which Bradbury worked quite a bit on, and uh, you know, an implosion bombs not as straightforward as a gun type bomb, and so they thought that it'd be a good idea to you know kind of make sure that it worked before they went and dropped it over enemy territory. Bradbury played several important roles in conducting this test. First of all, he assembled the Trinity device's non-nuclear components. And you can see in that top picture there, uh, kind of at least the silo silhouette, that's Bradbury right there uh, with his pair of scissors, just going at it, getting that thing put together. Uh, now, this is an interesting one. He also devised procedures for hoisting the bomb to the top of the tower. Now, some of you who are new to this history might be thinking, well, whoa, 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 tower. What's the deal with the tower? Well, they built this tower hoping that it would help reduce the amount of fallout that was created by the test. Only one problem, if you build a 100 foot tower, how do you get this giant bomb to the top of it? <laughs> and so Bradbury got the exciting task of that. And you know, I was going through the archives looking at the uh, original procedures. I was kind of surprised by what I found. Uh, in the original procedures, the primary instruments that they used were uh, mattresses, strong drink, and prayer. Uh, so uh, ap apparently successfully though, uh, because as you can see, that's uh, in the next two photos there, that's Norris Bradbury standing at the top of that tower uh, down outside of Alamogordo uh, and Socorro. The test was successfully conducted on July the 16th, 1945. So we're just a couple of days away uh, from the anniversary and it achieved a yield of 21 kilotons. That's, that's a lot of energy, 21,000 tons of TNT all wrapped in a few kilograms of fissile material. Now, this is one of my favorite parts of the presentation, Bradbury's quote. Some of you may have been up to the museum and seen like the day that never, or no, no, the, uh, what was it? Uh, the town that never was, that's right. Anybody seen the town that never was up there? You know, they show like the picture of the bomb, you know, everything goes silent at first. And then it, you hear like the voice of Jim Tuck and he says, what have we done? And then, uh, then shortly after that, Oppenheimer comes on there, you know, and he says, I remembered the Bhagavad Gita. I am death, or I am become death, the destroyer of all worlds. You know, all this drama and everything, right? Well, this is what Bradbury thought. For me to say I had any deep emotional thoughts about Trinity, I didn't. I was just damn pleased that it went off. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so there you go. You've got Oppenheimer on one side, and then you've got Bradbury on the other. Uh, always the pragmatist. Norris Bradbury. Of course, I think I would feel the same if my job had been to set this thing up, get this thing to the top of the tower. I would just want a successful test and get out of Dodge. So, uh, that, and that's exactly what happened. Well, now we can talk about the end of the war. We know the bombs will work. And uh, so quickly thereafter, the bombs were prepared for their employment against the Japanese empire. Hiroshima was bombed August 6, 1945. Uh, 80,000 were killed immediately by the 15 kiloton blast. Now, this, the Hiroshima bomb was the gun type weapon. 
it used more material, it got a little bit less bang. That was one of the other benefits of the implosion bomb. You get more bang uh, for the amount of material that you put in it. But nonetheless, it was completely devastating. Now on August 8th, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. Up to that time, they had not been to war uh, against each other, and the Japanese had been trying to negotiate through Japan and Switz or uh, I'm sorry, uh, through the Soviet Union and Switzerland, a, an acceptable peace. They had been doing that for months because the acceptable peace that they wanted was not the same as the unconditional surrender that was demanded by the Allies. And so this was a catastrophic blow to the Japanese uh, when the Soviets invaded all of their troops in China. Remember, the Japanese were all over the place. They still had, I think, I've heard estimates as high as two million soldiers still in uniform. Many of them were in China, Manchuria, Korea, and all of a sudden, their bargaining partner, the Soviet Union, was mauling them. And so this was a great blow to Japan as well. Nagasaki was bombed the next day. 45,000 were killed immediately by the 21 kiloton blast. Now this is a device that is just like the one that was tested at Trinity, uh, an implosion type device. Now you had similar, similar casualty figures in both cases, uh, of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but many of those casualties became fatalities in the hours and the days and the weeks that came after the attacks. And so the total casualties for these two attacks approached 200,000 uh, fatalities, I should say. Uh, on August 14th, Japan surrendered unconditionally. There was no special agreement in place to allow the emperor to stay there and to keep his position. We used him to our advantage to pacify the Japanese people when we, as we occupied uh, mainland Japan. There were no special agreements. They surrendered on the same terms that were offered at Potsdam. We'll keep, let me point out a couple of things. This is, uh, this is the Batman unit shortly before its departure to uh, Hiroshima. This is a drawing. This is one of the leaflets warning the Japanese about the attacks that were about to come and that they should stand up against their government. This is what's left after an atomic ta attack on a city. Complete devastation. And this is one of the rare photographs of the uh, Hiroshima mushroom cloud. So we've won World War II. Got that out of the way. Now we're going to talk about Oppenheimer's successor because uh, Oppenheimer didn't really stick around very long after World War II was over. He got out of here. He had other things to do. He was famous uh, throughout the country and throughout the world at the time. And uh, he did not want to continue to be the director here. He uh, worked with General Groves to find a successor, and they mutually agreed that Norris Bradbury was the right man for the job. Now, um, I want to read a couple of quotes here, first of all, on why Bradbury was selected to be the director, and this is from General Groves. After much thought and considerable discussion with Oppenheimer and others, I asked Dr. Norris Bradbury to take the position. Bradbury had spent several years at Los Alamos and had played an important part in the development of the gun-type bomb. Now, he means implosion-type bomb there, minor uh, mistake. Also, and I think this is very important to Groves, uh, he was a Navy Reserve officer, a circumstance I thought would help him in maintaining smooth relations between the civilian scientific staff and the military administrative officers. So pretty glowing opinion uh, there of Norris Bradbury. Now, there's one problem. The University of California was hired by Groves to be the contract administrator here during the war. And they were brought in, really, the, the most important reason was as a recruiting tool. You know, there were a lot of scientists who were doing work at important places like MIT, Chicago, on product, uh, projects like radar. How do you recruit people away from those important wartime jobs and bring them out here? Especially when they were going to have to join the army and do science as members of the military. Well, it, it was a problem. And that's one of the reasons why the University of California came in so that scientists could be recruited to join the staff of the University of California. Well, they were still running the lab at the end of World War II. They didn't want to be. They wanted to get out of here as soon as they could, but nonetheless, they were still here. Groves and Oppenheimer. Doesn't mention anything about talking to the university, does it? <laughs> the University of California was not very happy with Oppenheimer and Groves 
for going out and making Bradbury the director of this place. And I think that that becomes clear in this statement by Robert Underhill. Now you can see his title under there, Secretary Treasurer of the UC Board of Regents. Big deal, right? Well, it was a big deal. <laughs> Underhill was a bulldog. <laughs> and you know what his basic job was? You see the title there, but you know what his real job was? Keep the university out of trouble. And here is the military going and hiring University of California employees to run big institutions without even talking to them. University wasn't happy. Underhill says, the decision as to whether or not and when the university leaves the project would not at all be based on Dr. Bradbury's opinion, for he had never really been our employee and had no administrative touch with the university and the controlling board. In fact, his methods of administration in many respects are not along lines approved or developed by the university. Mm. So there you have it. <laughs> We're not off to a good start, are we? <laughs> you know, as you can see in that first bullet there, from the time that uh, the war ended until the spring of 1946, the technical staff was basically cut in half, down from about 2,500 to about 1,200. People were leaving left and right. All the big names had already left. The guys like Fermi, all this. Now that's not to say, and I think that Bradbury was the first one to speak up back then, that's not to say all the talent left. In fact, there was a whole lot of talent left behind. But all your guys with name recognition that were big professors and did all this, off they went. So he's lost a lot of the leaders who built the bomb. They're all out the door. He's got to, you know, he, his, bo his boss, the University of California, not really thrilled with his appointment as director. And there are other issues as well. You know, the Manhattan Project was operated by the Army Corps of Engineers, right? Well, that wasn't, they weren't going to permanently run the laboratory. It was going to be turned over to a civilian uh, institution, which at that time didn't exist yet. But everybody knew it was going to happen. It would just take Congress you know, some time to figure out exactly what they wanted to do. So he got some direction from the military. He didn't know who was going to come in to run the place. The university was mad at him. Half his staff was gone. Not a very good situation for Norris Bradbury. So let's talk about what he started to do about that because he was very proactive during this period. Now, uh, in addition to all of the chaos administratively that he was suffering through, he had to deal with domestic emergencies as well. <laughs> there were problems with housing. Even though all those people left, the housing was still subpar. There was, I think there's probably still a shortage of it even after everybody left. <laughs> and this would be a problem that Norris Bradbury dealt with for most of his career. There was a lack of water. That, the first winter that he was in charge, the pipes froze. They couldn't get any water. They had to have it brought up from the valley in trucks. So he's got a lot on his plate. This is what he did. In really just his first few weeks, he developed this strategy uh, for the laboratory. First of all, he said, we will set up the most nearly ideal project we can. I, I like that, that wording there. That sounds like something I would say. The most nearly ideal. Well, basically what he meant by that is we're going to try and make this laboratory operate as efficiently as possible because we're going through a really tough time right now. Uh, we're going to try and manage all of these problems that we're dealing with. Now, number two, we will not discontinue weapon research until it is clearly indicated that this can be done. Now, that was an important decision, wasn't it? Here's the thing. Norris Bradbury out here, who's head of 1,200 people, is the one who is making that decision for the country because nobody else is. I think that shows you just how much responsibility that Norris Bradbury had at that time. Finally, we will decrease the project in size so that it can be accommodated on the Mesa on a civilian basis. Remember, all those people are leaving. A lot of the technical staff members were members of the Army. They had been in the Special Engineer Detachment. Bradbury had a lot going on, but these, this is what he was going to do. He was gonna be efficient, he was going to continue weapons research, and he was going to gradually transition down the project. I'll keep an eye on my watch here. Not that it matters, but uh, <laughs> now uh, I think that these things that we've just looked at are kind of uh, 
you know, Richard Baker, who was a former uh, laboratory associate, associate director, put it most bluntly, if Norris hadn't stayed, I think the lab would have collapsed. And that may very well have been the case. Now, that's one side, and that's where I have the word visionary. You see the words fortunate and visionary there. We've talked about the visionary part. Let's talk about the fortunate stuff, too, because Bradbury had some circumstances that were beyond his control that helped out. Operation Crossroads provided the lab with a reprieve, a definite reprieve. Now here's the thing, which branch of the armed services was responsible for building and delivering the atomic bombs in World War II? The Army. You know, the Army had done that. They had control of this project. They had nuclear weapons. Well, guess what the Navy wanted? <laughs> the Navy wanted a piece of the pie. I don't think they exactly knew what to do with it, but they said, well, hey, uh, um, we want some bombs. Let's, uh, let's get a bunch of ships together and go blow some stuff up. Let's see what'll happen. That's what the Navy wanted to do. That was, that was Operation Crossroads. And you can see the picture. This was one of the tests uh, that was conducted as part of Operation Crossroads out at uh, Inuitok, um, I, or I believe, is this Bikini? Mike's? Bikini. Bikini, okay. Out at a remote Pacific atoll. Uh, <laughs> and you can see, uh, there are a lot of ships there. A lot of these were really world famous ships that had been collected from the German and Japanese navies, the United States Navy as well, and uh, now they all rest at the bottom of the lagoon there. Uh, but anyway, you get the Navy interested in what you're doing, you've got a contract. And so that was one thing that really helped the laboratory uh, out quite a bit. And Bradbury himself states, what held the place together was the Navy's program to determine the effects of nuclear bombs against naval vessels. And uh, I think that he played a small role in keeping it together as well. Uh, but nonetheless, those are two of the main things that I see at work there. I believe it was Louis Rosen that first referred to Norris Bradbury as the savior of Los Alamos. And uh, I think that we've already seen basically why he is uh, referred to as the savior. But even after Operation Crossroads, the laboratory in this community were still not entirely out of the woods. One of the things that made Bradbury, so very successful, especially in these early days, was it was easy to like him. Remember that quote that we saw at the very beginning of the presentation? Remember how awful his relationships were <laughs> when he first became director? He turned them all around. He successfully collaborated with General Groves, who had hired him. That was about the only thing that he had going for him in the very beginning. Under Groves' quasi-direction, Bradbury began to build his ideal laboratory that we talked about on the last slide. Now, finally, in 1947, that civilian agency to run the laboratories and the nuclear weapons program of the country, finally in place. So Congress finally got it done, and it was called the Atomic Energy Commission. And uh, many of you know Glenn Seaborg. He was uh, the AEC chairman, 1951 Nobel laureate, a Manhattan Project veteran. He had this to say, reflecting back on those days. In early 1947, at least a substantial minority of the AEC's General Advisory Committee, and this was chaired by uh, Oppenheimer at the time, I believe, believed that neither Los Alamos nor Norris Bradbury would long be on the atomic energy scene. So again, we're still, we're still in the woods. Still gotta get out of that. Uh, he convinced the Atomic Energy Commission to adopt his plans for Los Alamos. He went into a great amount of detail saying what he was doing, sent it off, I guess they liked it because here we are today. That was Norris Bradbury. That was Norris Bradbury who came up with a plan and sold it. And so in the pictures here uh, over, let me see, it's on, on uh, the left, you see Bradbury with Groves. And then in the other picture, that's Bradbury with Carol Tyler. There probably aren't too many people who remember Carol Tyler. He was the area manager uh, at the time. And so he was the guy who was in charge of Z Division, which became Sandia, Los Alamos, uh, the Santa Fe Operations Office. He was the liaison between Bradbury and everybody in Washington. And these two got together, uh, or got along well together throughout uh, Tyler's tenure there. I think he was the area manager until 1954. So he was in place for a very long time, and uh, Bradbury worked with him as well. And Bradbury also won the confidence of the UC Board of Regents over time. In fact, as you'll see on the next slide, I'll give away a preview. 
he actually became friends with Mr. Underhill. Remember Mr. Underhill from a few quotes ago who basically said, Bradbury didn't know what he's doing. He shouldn't even be here. They became very good and close friends uh, as well. Now, during this time, research-wise, the lab refined fission weapons and continued research on the super. Now, everybody remember that last part because we're going to come back to that uh, during a little bit of controversy a few slides from now. So we've talked about why Bradbury was the savior. Have I convinced everybody that he was the savior? Yeah? yeah. Maybe? Not hearing a lot of feedback, but I guess this is all formal, and so I need to act more formal. A lot so. of it just <laughs> and a lot of it just happened, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and, uh, so anyway, now we'll talk about the architect. Now, Bradbury is also considered the architect of the modern laboratory, and this was an ongoing process that started in the early days, and we'll talk about this here, but it continued throughout his tenure. Now, the lab's future started to solidify in the later 1940s. We've seen a little bit of that already as the AEC is coming in, but because of Bradbury's ability to cooperate with the AEC and secure funding to work with the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy and other entities, they were, he was able to secure $100 million to rebuild the technical area in the later 1940s. Now, what that translated into was first the building of that bridge over there that leads to TA3. That was built, I think, in 1951, 52, in that time frame. Not too long after, the old administration building was built, and the first people started moving into that in 1945. All of that, the new technical area, CMR, uh, basically what is today TA3, all of the old buildings, started with this $100 million that he was able to get back in the very late 40s. There was also a $7 million housing project. And I'm sure a lot of people who might have been around back then would say, seven million bucks, that's all? <laughs> Didn't they know what was going on up here? <laughs> you know. But nonetheless, uh, they were able to get money to uh, work within the community as well. Now, this next bullet here, the tree sta uh, shaking statement, this is a very important, this was something that was very important, not just for the lab, but Norris Bradbury personally as well. Let's read this quote that we have here. When I made my six month statement upon becoming director, I didn't think I wanted to be the director. I thought I wanted to get out. But I decided I couldn't run a laboratory that would have a future, unless I was willing to put my own future on it. It needed a man that believed in it himself before others could believe in it. That's the attitude that Norris Bradbury gradually adopted for himself. And he expected it from other people at the laboratory as well. Now there were Many people that were still working here that had not left after the war, but they were kind of, eh, I don't know if I should stay or if I should go, yeah, just kind of float around, not really make a commitment. And the reason they didn't have to is that because part of their agreement for coming here in the first place during the war was that when they left, the government would pay all of their moving expenses. So they had this nice little cushion that they could fall back on. Well, here comes Bradbury and the tree state, uh, shaking statement. And he basically says, well, you know, uh, if you don't want to be here, you should really leave now because uh, we're not going to pay for you to leave. <laughs> and so a lot of people left. And uh, I believe it was Bradbury who said it had the desired effect. <laughs> and so the people that were left were committed, and he was certainly at the fore of that group. And again, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, Bradbury befriended Underhill during this time and worked on him on UC contract extensions. Remember Bradbury, half the technical staff, the University of California, none of them wanted to be here at the end of World War II. Things were beginning to change. And I think a lot of the UC's commitment to Los Alamos in those early days probably goes back to that personal relationship between Bradbury and the institution, probably even more specifically between Bradbury and Underhill at the individual level. Now I want to digress from our chronological look at Norris Bradbury to talk about Norris Bradbury, the Cold Warrior. Remember when we were talking about his plan for Los Alamos? I think that that does give insight into how much responsibility he had during this time. These are some quotes that I collected from uh, different parts of his career uh, from the very beginning, from the very end. I, see, I think you'll see some consistency in here, uh, quite a bit as a matter of fact. But I think these give you some insight into his mind as the director of a nuclear weapons laboratory. First, to bring peace by threatening war is possible. To bring peace by requesting and promising cooperation seems more dignified. But the request and the promise, and surely the threat, 
are both fortified by weaponeering now. He was a pragmatist. That's what I take away from that first quote. This was a very dangerous time in human history. You know, World War II had been dangerous enough. We were potentially on the precipice of World War III. This was a shaky time. The Soviets, who had been our allies during World War II, they weren't our friends. They never were. They were allies of convenience. I think that when Bradbury made a statement like this, I think that he was thinking of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact between Stalin and Hitler. I think he was thinking of the Soviet invasion of Finland, the annexation of Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. I think he remembered September 17th when the Soviets invaded Poland. We forget that, don't we? I think that he forgets about how Northern Bukovina, Bessarabia, were also taken before World War II, and then the enslavement of the Eastern Bloc after World War II. This was a very difficult diplomatic period. Now, I want to focus on, uh, so, well, let's, let's move over to the quote uh, on the other side of the page. One hopes that weapons, uh, weapon emphasis will decrease with time. We are not a warring nation. The mere possession of weapons does not bring about war. Again, in that, I think you see the pragmatist. I think that in Norris Bradbury, who was very interested in arms control and reduction, I think that what he was really interested in as well was looking at the underlying behaviors that necessitated the existence of these weapons in the first place. And I think in this quote, he's attempting to get past that. Now, this final quote, I think, is, is one, of my, uh, uh, one of my favorites. I, myself, with considerable knowledge of nuclear things, with some knowledge of their military use, but with only a plain citizen's feelings about people and nations and hopes and fears, would prefer to try to follow the path of hope. In Norris Bradbury, you had the ultimate pragmatist, but he was also an idealist. He was hopeful. He always looked toward the future. And I think that he looked at nuclear weapons as being just a temporary bargaining chip until we could get to a world that would allow, uh, well, a, war, uh, a, a world absent of war and nuclear weapons. We'll continue on. And I'll have, I'll have some more evidence in the, of that in a little bit. We need to talk about the hydrogen bomb for a few minutes, though. Now, wartime super research, uh, super was another word for the hydrogen bomb, uh, expanded with the laboratory. We never stopped doing hydrogen bomb research. In fact, we had a conference in 1946. Uh, you see that picture right there. Many of you have probably seen that picture. That was taken in 1946 at the Super Conference, and there are several uh, people you might recognize in there, at least if I had a bigger picture for you to look at. Uh, this is Bradbury, that's John Manley, uh, that's Richard Feynman right there. I apologize for my shaky hand. Uh, and there were several others that came back to the laboratory as well to look at this. The research didn't go away, it expanded gradually with the laboratory. And, uh, you know, different things were developed to support that research. After the war, the Maniac computer was developed for hydrogen bomb research, so the first supercomputers, and the ones we're building today, <laughs> were built uh, very much for this purpose of national security and doing bomb research, doing bomb calculations. Now, after the Soviets tested their first nuclear bomb in 1949, President Truman ordered research to continue. If anything, this has accelerated the work. I think a lot of people look at this statement and say, oh, well, super research stopped, and Truman's statement started it again. If anything, it just accelerated what was already going on. For one thing, you need to have a solid fission research uh, program in place if you're going to be successful in the fusion research field. And so that was what was going on at the laboratory. As you see from Bradbury's quote there, thermonuclear work never stopped. In response to President Truman's statement, Bradbury decided to put the lab on a six-day work week. He made that decision himself because he thought it was important. On October 31st, 1952, the first full-scale uh, hydrogen bomb was tested. It was an undeliverable design. It achieved a yield of 10.4 megatons. Now remember, when we were talking about Trinity, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, we're talking kilotons, thousands of tons. Now we're talking about millions of tons of TNT equivalent. You can look, uh, this is out at uh, Inuitok, where it was tested. It was tested on this little island called Aluga Lab. That was before the test. That was a uh, reconnaissance photo of the uh, islands. This is afterwards. That's where Aluga Lab was, that big hole in the ocean floor, doing 
advising in Washington, he could be a pretty nasty guy at times. And a lot of people didn't like him. He ticked off the wrong fellow, though. And that was a guy named Louis Strauss, who was a Naval Reserve Admiral. He was also the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. He made Strauss look like an idiot <laughs> in front of Congress. Uh, and uh, I heard somebody say which he was over here. So <laughs> still some very strong feelings uh, on, on this topic here in Los Alamos. Uh, but anyway, uh, when Oppenheimer's clearance was being investigated for renewal, they held a hearing. And uh, during that time, Bradbury did not take public sides on the issue. Now, for one reason, he didn't think it was the right thing to do. He was the director of an AEC laboratory. He didn't think that it was his place to grandstand about Oppenheimer's guilt or innocence or anything else. There was also another practical aspect of this. He worked for Louis Strauss <laughs> and the AEC as well. He was in an uncomfortable position at this time. Now, the laboratory, of course, overwhelmingly supported Oppenheimer. Uh, Bradbury, though, I think it's forgotten, he did testify in Oppenheimer's defense on April 22, 1954. It was primarily centered over the question, did Oppenheimer hold up research on the hydrogen bomb? Did he try and stop research on the hydrogen bomb? That was the charge that was leveled at him. And I think it's interesting because you can read other testimonies like Louis Alvarez, which basically kind of say, yeah, uh, he persuaded people not to work on it, which was fairly damaging. Bradbury offered a very supportive testimony. He argued that Oppenheimer did not hinder hydrogen bomb research, but it wasn't enough. The deck was stacked against Oppenheimer. He wasn't going to get his clearance back under any uh, circumstances, I don't think. The AC chose not to reinstate that clearance. Shortly thereafter, and this is what Fred's talk will be on, nearly 500 Los Alamos scientists uh, protested the decision. This is a quote that uh, Bradbury gave regarding Robert Oppenheimer, his uh, predecessor. I never saw a man in my life more fanatically dedicated to his country. And one can be dedicated to one's country without agreeing with everything his country does. And so that was Bradbury on Oppenheimer. Now we'll keep rolling along. We're to the last four or five slides here. I want to talk about the golden age of nuclear R&D. I think that it was my friend John Hopkins who, who coined this phrase. And the reason why I like it is because this is when many of the major significant advances, the technically sweet research uh, was done. Now you can see just some of, take a look at some of these numbers just alone to see if they don't back this up. The nation's stockpile grew from two, two, after the war, to 22,229 between 1945 and 1961. During that same time, the United States conducted more than 200 nuclear tests. As we talked about a few slides ago, the first full-scale hydrogen bomb was tested in 52. The first tactical nuclear weapon was tested in 1953. Our largest test, the largest test in the history of the country, was Castle Bravo. It achieved a yield of 15 million tons, a yield equivalent to 15 million tons of TNT. That's a thousand little boys. An enormous, enormous shot. So we've improved fission weapons. We've miniaturized nuclear weapons. We've made really big, destructive, strategic weapons. What do you do next? And it was at this time, and by the way, I'll point out a few of these pictures. This is Norris Bradbury out in the, oh, I guess my clicker died. Okay, so uh, going from right to left, that's Bradbury. The guy in the middle is Al, uh, uh, Al Graves. Uh, he was one of the test directors at the time. And then on the left, that's Curtis LeMay in the black socks. And so I uh, <laughs> guess he didn't know that there was a camera in the area. But uh, they're all out in, uh, out in the Pacific. The, uh, the, the photo next to them, uh, there we go. That's a picture of the uh, Ivy Mike test. This is our first tactical nuclear weapon. That was a shot called uh, uh, Upshot Not Whole Grable. It was an atomic artillery shell. And this is, uh, this is Greenhouse George, which was one of the shots leading up to the Mike test. Now, we talked about, you know, we've done all this research, what do we do next? And of course, for the next few decades, you know, we refined weapons, we made them better, we made them more reliable, we made them safer. But in the late 1950s, 
a lot of people thought we might get out of the nuclear weapons business. You know, in 58, there was a testing moratorium that started. We didn't test anything between 58 and 61. How do you attract talent to a laboratory that might not have a mission? And this was one of the big challenges that Bradbury faced. And this is when he began to look at other ways that the laboratory might be able to help the country. This is when you begin to see the diversification of the laboratory. Remember when we talked about Norris Bradbury, the architect of the modern laboratory? This was really phase two of the construction. Uh, some of these research initiatives came to include the development of nuclear-powered rockets for space exploration. This was Project Rover. I bet a lot of people in this room with all those hands that I saw probably worked on Project Rover or got a pretty good, uh, pretty good view of it. It was basically going on from 57 to 72, roughly the same time as the Vietnam War. Uh, another thing, industrial applications for nuclear explosions. This was primarily a Livermore project, although we did a couple of shots. Uh, there were a couple of shots that uh, Livermore did here in New Mexico, which I think we still take personally. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Plowshare was, you know, basically the idea was behind this, to give you an example, is let's say that you want a harbor where there is no harbor. Let's go get some bombs out and make one. And so that's the kind of stuff that Plowshares was, really peaceful uses for weapons. This is the kind of stuff that Dwight Eisenhower was very interested in as well. Uh, continuing on, controlled thermonuclear fusion research, Project Sherwood. That was a big project for many, many years. So we've got a couple of street names down in White Rock uh, already. <laughs> uh, the development of nuclear verification technologies. This was the Vela satellite. Uh, the Vela satellite also discovered, uh, I think it was gamma ray bursts. That's something that a lot of people are interested in all of a sudden. I'm getting all kinds of requests in the archives for Vela photographs. <laughs> so if some of you worked on the Vela proje project, let me know because somebody might want to interview you because that is... Uh, that is a topic that uh, all the documentary makers are racing each other to uh, make a show on. And then finally, subatomic exploration, LAMP, which is now LANCE, uh, the giant uh, particle accelerator. All this stuff came out of the late 50s and the, and the 60s under Bradbury's uh, initiatives to try and diversify the laboratory, make it more valuable to the nation, to be able to do more things, but also to keep the best and the brightest here at Los Alamos and to attract more which could be used at some point as part of the weapons program. So a few pictures that we have here. Uh, this is one of the Bella satellites. This is some uh, uh, thermonuclear, uh, what did I say there? Controlled thermonuclear fusion research. This is uh, one of the human, human studies types uh, or health physics types of issues. This is one of the plastic men in Wright Langham uh, who was killed in the aircraft accident many, many years ago. Many of you probably knew uh, Langham. And uh, this, is, this is Bradbury. This is one of the reactors from the, uh, from the rover project right here. That uh, a lot of progress was made on that project. Again, it was 15 years old when it kind of collapsed. Uh, you know, and for those of you who may have worked on rover, we get requests from NASA every few years in the archives. Uh, you know, they hear about this and they get interested and it kind of fades, but who knows, maybe someday we'll actually get that thing finished off. And uh, then here's Bradbury with a pie chart. You know, back, back in the early days, you didn't need a pie chart. There was a big round circle that said weapons in the middle. <laughs> now, at this stage, you know, as Bradbury got into this, about a third of the budget was spent on the weapons program. So there was a dramatic decrease uh, in emphasis on that, although there was still a lot of work that was being done, and we're going to see that uh, on the next slide, I believe. Okay, so we got all our pictures there. Everybody still doing okay? Yeah. We're almost there. We're going to bring it home in a few more minutes. Um, so anyway, uh, there's supposed to be a picture of Bradbury there. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll talk about Bradbury's final decade as director. You know, one, another reason, you know, we talked about one of the reasons why Bradbury was successful. He was a nice guy. I, I think that's a fair statement. He got along with people. He worked with people. He was willing to make compromises. He ran a tight ship. And I think that a lot of people of the time really respected that. He also had basically as much money as he ever asked for. <laughs> he would send his requests into Congress. He'd get all the money that he asked for. A lot of times he would have some left over at the end of the year. I don't know how many people have told me this. It's several, but he would have leftover money. He'd send it back to Washington. <laughs> can you believe that? And today, can you, you know, fiscal responsibility, what? <laughs> Well, guess who took the money? 
Livermore, yeah, so, you know. <laughs> but, uh, no, you know, this was, uh, for the first time in the 1960s, Bradbury had to begin dealing with the budget. The budget became a problem. One of the things that made him a great success was that he didn't have to worry about that. Now, from the 60s forward, one of the great things about, one of the things that he did was manage what he was given. So this was a new game for Bradbury. And I think this is probably when he started to like the job a little bit less uh, as well. We have a quote from him at the bottom of the page. The post-war years may have been the golden age for science and scientists, and we may or may not have deserved it. Now, maybe we're in the Iron Age, but we still have it pretty damn good. And laboratory did continue to thrive during this period. Uh, you know, we talked about how the test bans and moratorium of the era, a complete test ban seemed like a real possibility at this time. What happened was there was a limited test ban. We went to underground nuclear testing. Here's a uh, fresh underground nuclear test right there, the crater being formed. Now, despite the arms treaties, despite the fact that there were new limitations in place, such as we could not test in the atmosphere, we couldn't test in space, we couldn't test underwater, Despite all those, we still did 428 tests just in the 60s, and we did all of them underground. Uh, or for the, I think in the very early 60s, we did do some at very high altitude, but essentially those tests were done underground. So during Bradbury's period, let's see, from a few slides ago, we had 200 nuclear tests there about. Here's another 428. The nation conducted, I believe it was 1,054 nuclear tests. A majority of them were just done under Bradbury, one director. Now, by 1970, when Bradbury was about ready to hang him up, there were 4,000 lab employees, and the annual budget was $100 million. And when I put that on there, I thought that was an impressive number. But 100 mil just ain't what it is anymore, I guess. But uh, the budget increased, the staff increased. Now, a few pictures before we uh, go to our next slide. Of course, Probably everybody's seen this picture right here with uh, President Kennedy, that's Senator Clinton P. Anderson, who I believe the Mason facility Lance is now named after, uh, with Bradbury in the middle, saw our nuclear test. Now these are a couple of gems that our photographic image archivist, Dan Comstock, was able to dig uh, out of the catacombs of our uh, uh, collection over at the laboratory. Uh, the one in the middle, that's Bradbury with Professor Love. Remember Professor Love, who, who had educated him at Berkeley? I don't know if you can see it real well, but look at that look on Bradbury's face. He looks a lot like that little baby did when his mama was holding him, didn't he? You know? So I bet he was really having a lot of fun when the professor came back to his laboratory to see uh, what Bradbury had built. Now that color photo there, uh, the gentleman on the right, many of you may recognize him, that's Raymer Schreiber. Uh, the, the other guy is Werner von Braun. They're out at the uh, Nevada test site inspecting the uh, reactors for the uh, uh, rover program. And of course, von Braun was the guy who designed the V1 and the V2 and worked with the Germans, and so came and helped us after World War II. Well, let's, let's get to the end of Bradbury's career here. On August 29th, 1970, Seaborg presented Bradbury with the Atomic Energy Commission's Enrico Fermi Award. And there is a picture of Seaborg with Bradbury. Remember what Seaborg said about half the presentation ago? Boy, we didn't think he'd be around very long. In fact, we didn't even think his laboratory would be around very long. And here's Bradbury, almost a quarter of a century later, being given the highest award that the AEC can give. That's another thing, you know, throughout his career, Bradbury was able to maintain those great relationships that he had built up with the University of California, with the Atomic Energy Commission, with Congress. That eroded over time for many different reasons, but that was one of Bradbury's, that was an important piece of his legacy, I think. The museum and the science hall was renamed in his honor, and today we still have the Bradbury Science Museum. And I think that's appropriate because this community and the laboratory are really his creation. Harold Agnew succeeded Bradbury September 1st, 1970. I, uh, I think that Bradbury and Agnew got along pretty well. I think they like to argue a lot. I think they probably annoyed each other every now and then, but I think there was a level of respect there uh, between the two. Now, uh, this, uh, you see the science hall, you see uh, Harold and Norris together there. 
This is at the, uh, this is at the resignation party. It wasn't a retirement party because as you see that quote, when a man says he's going to retire, you immediately start thinking about a rocking chair. I'm not ready for one. And he wouldn't. We're going to see a little bit of his life after the laboratory. But this is the resignation party there. I think we're ready for a new slide. We'll talk about life after Lazarus for a little bit. Bradbury declined Agnew's offer to serve as an advisor. Agnew did offer him, said, you know, I, you know Norris, we'd like you to stick around. I could really use your advice. It was a very nice gesture, a gesture but Bradbury declined. He essentially said, you know, Harold, you wanted the job. It's yours now. You can do fine, <laughs> okay? Uh, he was a University of New Mexico regent from 1969 to 1971. Not a very long tenure. I'm not sure how much he enjoyed this. I think this was a very difficult time uh, for the state and the university system. This was, uh, uh, you know, there was a lot of unrest in the university system, lots of protests. I don't think that suited him, but nonetheless, he was a regent during that period. For many years, he was a member of the Episcopal Parish Vestry. He kept the lawn over there. <laughs> you know, the, uh, they've been very kind over there to me. I've, I've given a couple of presentations, but they could probably use his help on the lawn. You know, <laughs> uh, Bradbury kept the lawn. If there was a leaky faucet, uh, he took care of that. He, uh, he was very active uh, with, with his church congregation. Uh, he also continued to make furniture. I've been, uh, I, I read, I forgot if it was Norris or a reporter who said that he made lots of furniture for his grandchildren, made beds for them. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a really neat type of thing. I bet that's quite a family heirloom. Uh, and he also continued to travel extensively. He was always doing something, both as director and in his private life. Now, uh, before we get to the end here, you know, I meant to ask Jim the other day, but I do believe this is a Mercedes Benz in the driveway. So I was wondering if, that, if he finally gave up the old truck for a Mercedes. I guess if you drive a Model A and then a pickup truck, I guess you're entitled to one, right? Uh, but uh, but uh, I'll have to ask about that later. Now, uh, here's, here's Lois and, uh, and uh, Norris right outside their home. This was taken about the time that he retired. This is a great portrait here of uh, probably Norris Bradbury uh, around 1990, maybe a little bit earlier. Now this group here, and I wish that I had an entire screen so you could make out the faces because I bet there are a lot of people uh, that you can recognize in this photograph. Now this guy here in the back, or to you, this blob, uh, <laughs> if it's even a blob to you, that's my predecessor, Roger Mead. And Roger Mead had the opportunity to go back to the Pacific with all of these old veterans of the atmospheric testing era. And as you can see, Right in the middle of this group at the front is Norris Bradbury. He was able to make the trip as well. Some of the other people in this photograph uh, include, I believe this is John Clark, Daryl Froman, Robert Brownlee, uh, Robert Campbell. I'm sure there are many others that I've, I've forgotten and I do apologize for that. But uh, I was always jealous of Roger because he got to go on this great expedition. Uh, and and, and uh, with all these guys and let them tell the history as they were seeing it. Now, unfortunately, by that time, Norris Bradbury was suffering from uh, several health problems. When that picture was taken, he was already suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, he, uh, in his final years, I believe he had nicked his leg with an ax in an accident when he was chopping lumber or something like that. Uh, you know, the wound never really healed, gout ensued. I think that he had to have an entire leg amputated and parts of the other one. Uh, Norris Bradbury was in a lot of pain uh, physically at that time. Lois was always by his side. You know, one of the, uh, there, there is a book published by the Historical Society uh, that the late Jenny Ebinger put together. She was the editor for. That is a compilation of really neat laboratory publications, some other things that she put together. She wrote the end of that book, and it is very touching. It's not very long. It just takes a few minutes to read. But I think that it's really, um, it's really touching to see what Norris Bradbury had to go through in his final days and how he and Lois took care of each other. So I would encourage you, if you don't have that book, go to the museum, buy a copy, order one off the Historical Society site. There's a lot of good stuff in there. You're going to see a lot of stuff in this presentation uh, put a lot more eloquently in that book <laughs> uh, than I'm able to uh, give it credit for. Finally, on August 20th, 1997, Norris Bradbury passed away. 
This is our last slide for this evening. I want to talk about the legacy of Norris Bradbury, and hopefully from the presentation, you've probably, hopefully, already got a pretty good sense of just what that legacy is. But first, Bradbury considered nuclear weapons a necessary but temporary evil. Now, his, this is his quote. Nobody likes atomic bombs. I hate them, but it has to be done. This is the practical side of Norris Bradbury. This is the we're fighting the evil empire of Soviet Russia, Norris Bradbury. But again, he looked at them as that temporary bargaining chip. These can buy us peace. These can avert a third world war. And maybe, just maybe, we can buy mankind enough time to where we can figure out a way to change the world and to make warfare obsolete. I think it was that hope that Bradbury had, that progressive thinking, you know, idealistic, realistic or not, the positive thinking that Bradbury had, I think is something that must be remembered today as we move forward uh, here at the laboratory and beyond. Next, to maintain a thriving weapons program, he diversified the mission of the laboratory, and I'll go ahead and tack on there. He also believed diversification would make the laboratory a permanent asset to the nation. Today's laboratory is a large, multidisciplined facility that is an asset to the country. Bradbury is the one who started that, and these are the reasons why. And finally, I believe that it was Sig Hecker that first proposed this. Norris Bradbury is the father of the modern federal laboratory system. That goes all the way back, in my opinion, to those dark days after World War II, when there was nobody there. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody provided direction, a plan. Norris Bradbury was that man for a while. And I think that that, uh, I think what uh, Director Hecker said is, is true. I think that you can see Bradbury's influence not only here at Los Alamos, but also in places like Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, Sandia, and beyond within our complex. I'm going to leave you with one last quote from Bradbury, and then, uh, then I'm going to turn it back over to John. In contrast with almost every field of human endeavor, the atomic bomb business seeks to put itself out of business. Our one objective at Los Alamos has always been that bombs never get used that the United States was always ahead, both in technology and a willingness to discuss the abandonment of nuclear warfare. With that, I give you Norris Bradbury. Thank you very much. Suggestions, corrections? <laughs> Come on, I'm just waiting for one person. Okay, all right. We had the, the uh, opportunity to have Bob Christie in town not too long ago. And I even had the opportunity to introduce him. And what I said was, gee, he was a lucky guy. When he made that bomb, it worked the first time. And then they shot it again and it worked the first time. That is an important thing that you didn't mention. These bombs, they work. Yes. <laughs> the bombs do work, by the way, just in case. <laughs> yes, Harris. I'd like to say something about this. And one thing about Norris Bradbury <coughs> is the things he did not do. He left a lot of the laboratory alone to develop in a wonderful way. <laughs> Did, did everyone hear that? Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Harris Mayer, who's up here with us today, has made the point that a lot of good that Bradbury did was actually what he did not do. 
he allowed portions of the laboratory to grow and to thrive in the direction that was best suited for them. And uh, did I capture that correctly? So thank you. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Harris. Uh, any, anything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. What was it about Bradbury that attracted Groves and Oppenheimer to pick him as the next director? I, I think that's a really good question. The, the question was, what attracted Groves and Oppenheimer to Bradbury? Now, uh, I'll give my version of the story. I think that I think John's got an Edward Teller anecdote. <laughs> he, may, he might want to suggest as well. You know, personally, I think the uniform made a difference. Uh, the fact that he was a Naval Reserve officer, uh, I think that alone was, was one of the major considerations. I think Groves trusted him. I think that, again, uh, another thing was he was a builder. He was a collaborator. And uh, as Groves said in his memoir when he was talking about how he thought that uh, Bradbury could ease the, uh, the relationship between the civil civilian and military employees. I think there was a lot to that. Now, so that was one aspect. He was, he was an authority figure in a sense. He was a naval officer. He's very good. Another thing was, he was a smart guy. Th this is a, uh, a, Stan or a, a Berkeley PhD who had been published. He had shown leadership. He was a group leader throughout his tenure at the laboratory. He had worked closely uh, with important laboratory figures such as Deke Parsons, who obviously trusted him. I think that Groves thought a lot of uh, Parsons. In fact, I think everybody thought a whole lot of Deke Parsons. And so I, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, Groves talked about uh, talking with Oppenheimer and others. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if one of those others was Deke Parsons. And I bet that uh, Bradbury also uh, got a good report from him. I mean, if he didn't ask, I'm sure Parsons would have given uh, him a very strong endorsement. But uh, you know, he had, he had been a leader. He had, uh, you know, he was a PhD. He had completed his degree. A lot of people had, had to go back to school. A lot of people were going back to other jobs. And that leads into another reason. He was available. <laughs> you know, that's one of the reason, reasons Robert Oppenheimer became the, la the director of the laboratory, isn't it? You know, there were guys like Arthur Compton, guys like uh, Ernest Lawrence who were working on projects. There were guys like Lee Dubridge who were working at MIT. A lot of the eminent Nobel stature type of professors were already tied up. Robert Oppenheimer was available. And I think it was the same way with Norris Bradbury. Norris Bradbury was here. He was responsible. He was a leader. He was very intelligent. He had a great attitude. He was in the Navy. I think uh, as they looked around the laboratory, uh, there weren't too many people that met all those qualifications. So that's, that's my personal opinion, uh, kind of tied in with what Grove said, if, if that answers it. So, thank you, Steve. Yes? Your story uh, says that uh, Bradbury married his, uh, his college roommate's sister, but he must have had another roommate, because McDougal told me at one time that he was smart. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have our first challenge of the night. <laughs> All right, so, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, addition, no, that sounds good. No, I'm just giving you a hard time. No, thank you for your comment. The comment was that uh, Duncan McDougall claimed to be Norris Bradbury's roommate in college and that it wasn't his sister. Uh, Lois Brad Bradbury was not his sister, so, so very good. Yes, another one. Yes. The quote sounded to me like the testimony he gave in support of the limited test ban treaty in 1963, it, uh, which, I, which I claim was responsible for the success of the treaty passing the Senate. Yes. And, and uh, set the stage for a modern arms control effort. I believe that's where that came from, as a matter of fact. This quote at the bottom of the page, uh, I don't know if anybody heard, but uh, this was part, I, I think, now I, I wish I had the document in front of me so I could make sure, so go check for yourself, don't trust me. <laughs> but I believe this was taken out of Bradbury's testimony in support of the 1958 arms, or, or uh, the, the 63 limited test ban, uh, rather, and, uh, and, and helped lead to some of the agreements that followed up on that. So did that, in another good addition, thank you. Is there anything else? That it? Thank you very much.